Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to you if you're here now with me. Welcome to you if you're in the future. If you're in the future watching this, you can check out the uh, description of this video for timestamps to skip to things that are relevant for you. Today we're talking about uh, chord progressions that work together, how to write complementary chord progressions. This could be for verse, chorus, could be for, I don't know, an intro and a drop, could be for whatever. Any kind of song structure doesn't matter. We're just talking about chord progressions that work together. Uh, while you check out the description, I have some links in there for uh, some courses I have on music theory, and a new one is coming all about chords and chord progressions, so stay tuned for that, as well as a link to my Discord server in there, which is a kind of chat room, hangout zone, where we talk about music theory as well as production and have weekly challenges and all sorts of fun stuff. So yeah, check the, check the description for timestamps if you're in the future. Otherwise, we are here live talking about chords, my favorite. I'm just going to post in the chat quickly for everybody. Hi, sweetie. Hi, Chris. Hello, Shamkra. Karsten, hello. Welcome to you all. I hope you're all doing so well. I'm happy to be here with you. And please, if you have any questions throughout the whole time, feel free. Ask anytime. You can even ask now, and I'll in, uh, incorporate it into the uh, flow of things. That's fine, too. So we're going to get going um, pretty quickly here. Hello, Amit. Welcome. And yeah, I just want to make sure the sound is good. So let me just play a chord for you. How's that? Every time I play a chord on here, I play F, I think. <laughs> ah, my keyboard's not lighting up. That's interesting. Let's see what we can do about that. There we go. Okay. Sound is all right. <laughs> I'm going to have to assume it is. And let's get started. Sound good. Okay. So, Today, we are talking about chord progressions that work together, how to write complementary chord progressions. This is a topic that I think a lot of people have trouble with, I had trouble with in the past. If you're someone who has a great ear, you probably don't have trouble with it, and that's fantastic. And if you are someone that has trouble with it, that's also fantastic, because then you can learn some things that might even um, illuminate some possibilities that weren't there otherwise. So. Uh, before we get started on some principles and ideas about all this kind of stuff, uh, I just wanted to go over some basic ideas um, on kind of theory and rules and all this kind of stuff, because we're going to talk a little bit about that, so I want to preface that. The first thing is, we probably all have heard this idea before, but if it sounds good, it is good. That's the golden rule of music, right? You don't need to understand something to have it sound good. It doesn't need to be theoretically correct. It doesn't need to anything. If it sounds good, it is good. Everything that I talk about today, there's probably a hundred examples of doing the exact opposite that works amazingly well, right? That's just the way it goes. But there's probably a million examples of it doing it, of it working well the way I'm talking about it. I'm talking about these principles as generalized ideas that I've observed over years of composing and studying and analyzing music, but they are not actually rules. Anything can happen. You can do anything right? There's no reason to follow any certain thing unless you want to, unless you feel stuck. That's what theory is really good for. Theory is good for understanding what it is that you're doing so that you can uh, apply it later in different situations. You can create iterations and variations of it, and it allows you to discover things that you might never discover just by your ear, because your ear doesn't know all the sounds, you know, unless you're a very <laughs> lucky person. Most of us, we don't know all the sounds just by ear, all the possible um, chord possibilities. And so theory can help you explore things that wouldn't be available otherwise. So I want to say that right off the bat. It's totally fine to just go by ear, right? To even to learn all these principles and then just go by ear and then never think about them again. I'm not, not going to hate on that at all. However, for people like myself that don't have a great ear, it's always been helpful for me to have theory to rely on because it helps me explore things and understand what I'm doing. Welcome, John. Welcome, Rev. Hope you're doing well. Okay, so the other thing that theory can do is help make translation faster from your mind to your song. You might hear things in your mind that you want to do, but 
trying to find those things can take a while. That's where ear training comes in. That's where theory comes in. Are you hearing a minor seventh chord? Is it the fifth of this key? Is it the third of the key? Is it, you know, all this kind of stuff. Theory and ear training are huge with that, of course. You have a good ear. Thank you, KK. Welcome. Hello, Nick. Welcome. Okay, so what we're going to cover today, we're going to start by covering what makes two progressions work together. What does it mean that two progressions work together? We're going to cover what doesn't work. How come two progressions don't work well together? When I say two, it could be as many as you want. We're just going to use two to begin with, right? Uh, what makes changes in progression interesting? When you compare this progression to this progression, what is it that makes the, the, the difference between them, the flow from one to the other, interesting? That's something we're going to talk about. And then we're going to have some practical techniques for generating ideas. And then um, we're going to have an analysis of a few real songs to discover some principles. I don't usually do this, but I wanted to do it for this um, session because, yeah, analyzing real music can is huge. I mean, it's been a huge part of my life, analyzing how chords work in real music because that's where it all works, right? That's where you see the examples of stuff that works <laughs> is music that people like. So it's great to study it because you can find all sorts of interesting techniques that you might not otherwise find. Of course, this being YouTube, I can't just play the music for you because I'm going to get whatever ads put on my thing or copyright or my audio stripped or whatever. All sorts of copyright issues come up when I try to play real music on the stream. Instead, I'm going to rely on, I program some stuff here. I'm also going to play some stuff for you and whatever. We're going to analyze some songs anyway. Um, so some required knowledge, some kind of prerequisites that would be good. Uh, would be how to build chords and scales. I'm not going to be talking about that today. I'm not going to talk about how to build major chords, minor chords, seventh chords. I'm not going to talk about how to build minor scales or Dorian mode scales, anything like that. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to even write chord progressions. We're talking about progressions that work together, not in general, how do you write a chord progression. I have videos on that. There's a whole course coming all about that, all about how to write chord progressions and all this fancy stuff you can do. So stay tuned for that if you, if you want to learn about that. But today is just what makes two chord progressions work together. So I'm going to assume that you've written a chord progression before, that maybe you're writing music already. I have to make that assumption. Also, the number system. I'm going to be speaking sometimes in numbers and sometimes in chord names. And that's just the way I work. That's the way many musicians work, just interchangeably. Sometimes it makes more sense to speak in numbers, the four chord, the flat seven chord, the two chord, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it's, it makes sense to speak in specifics, C major, F minor, blah, 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 that sort of thing. If you don't understand the number system, there's a lot of videos around, a lot of websites, a lot of everything that can teach it to you. It's not that hard. I've got videos on it too, somewhere on the channel. <laughs> you can find it there, or you can just search on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find a whole lot of information. Okay. Good. So without that out of the way, we can begin. So as I said, uh, if you have any questions, please ask anytime during the thing, because the answers to your questions are probably helpful to everybody. It's probably uh, probably other people who have the exact same question. Even if they're not here, they might be in the future watching, right? So please ask whenever, and I'll incorporate it into what I talk about. It's very helpful to everybody. Ah, Rev, thank you so much. So kind of you for the donation. Thank you for the generosity. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's get into it. There's so much to talk about here. I'm, I'm only going to scratch the surface of the surface, really. I mean, what a huge topic chord progressions in general and chord progressions that work together could be anything. There's so much to talk about. I just picked a few kind of main points I want to cover. And then, yeah, we'll get into it. Hey, Chris, welcome. Good to have you here. All right, so... Starting off with, what makes two progressions work together? When we say that two, two chord progressions complement each other or are in harmony or feel good flowing from one to the other, what is it? How come? So some general things to keep in mind. The first is something has to unify the progressions. Something has to unite them. If they are just completely different with no, no commonality, of course, that's not going to work, right? It seems probably too obvious, but it's good to think about. Something has to unite the progressions. Once you start thinking in this in this way, uh, you can find different different ideas that can unite the progressions. There's not just one idea. There's many ways to do that. So let's look at a few. First of all, being in the same key, diatonically speaking, you know, like diatonic means from the scale, from the scale you've chosen. So if we're in G and we're playing. Um, 
say, I don't know, let's play a one, going to four, going to six, going to two, how about a little bit more unconventional. So if we have this and we're in the key of G, then when we say something can unify the next progression and I say it's from the same key, that's pretty simple, right? It's just another chord from the key of G. So if you know your chords in the key of G, G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, F sharp diminished. All those chords will work, of course, because the chords we're already playing in that progression are showing our ears all the notes of the key. When we play through these chords, each chord is made of three notes, right? And the notes of those chords are displaying for our ear, for our mind, what the key is. It's showing all seven notes of the key. So any other chord that comes from that key, of course, is going to work with it because it's already using the notes that have been shown to us. That's the easiest way, right? That's the simplest, most straightforward way to understand what unites two chord progressions. So in a basic sense, if you learn nothing else, and if you don't know this already, the easiest way to write two progressions that work together is just to use chords from the same key. I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but like you can almost do anything within that. The, the two progressions can just be anything, roughly speaking, from the same key because they all share the same notes, they share the same tonic, they share the same basically everything. So they're just going to flow together. It's really not that hard. There's a lot of other principles, of course, you can go in to make it better. And we're going to talk about that. But to start off with, the most basic unifying principle is key. And key can be unifying in many ways. Right now we're talking about it in a very basic sense, which is just diatonic key. The ear is used to all those notes. You just play more of those notes with different root notes. That's all it is, really. Almost anything goes when it comes to that. The next thing you can do in terms of unifying in a key is um, the re a relative key or mode. And the most common thing is the relative minor. So if you're in G, the relative minor is three half steps down from your tonic. So you're on G, one, two, three, down to E. E minor is the relative minor. It's also the sixth note of the key, if you don't know that. If you come up, come up in a major scale and you go to the sixth note, that's your relative minor. When we talk about a relative scale, we just mean a scale that has all the same notes, but a different tonic, a different home note. So the key of G major and the key of E minor have all the same notes in them, they just have different tonics, right? So in the key of G major, G is the tonic, and the key of E minor, E is the tonic, right? That's all. But the notes, the actual notes inside them are exactly the same. That's what a relative scale is. Whereas a parallel scale has different notes, but the same tonic. So G major and G minor would be parallel scales. They both are tonic of G, but the other notes differ. Whereas G major and E minor have the same notes, but different tonics, which means they're relative scales. And there are many uh, other relative scales beyond just E minor, but that's the most common one. The relative minor of any major key is by far the most commonly used when you're writing chord progressions, um, kind of alternating back and forth, like it's just everywhere. But it could be anything else, like it could be A Dorian or B Phrygian or C Lydian or D Mixolydian, any of the relative modes of G. Of course, they're all going to work together because again, they're all made of the same notes. So long as you can convince the listener's ear that the tonic has shifted to whatever kind of relative note you want, uh, the rest of it will just fall into place pretty easily. So we talked about same key diatonic. Now we're talking about relative keys. So we're going to look at some examples of that as well, but I'm going to continue on for now, unless anyone has any questions. Just make sure. Anshul, welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks, Rev. I appreciate that. Andre, welcome. Hello. So um, from there, the next thing that can unite things under the heading of key is parallel modes. We just talked about parallel scales. So not relative, but parallel. So let's take an example of these two. So say we're in G. We'll, st we'll stick in G maybe for this uh, lesson today. So if we're in G and we're doing one, four, six, two, I just pick, literally pick those notes at random. I'm not using any kind of functional harmony. I'm not using anything fancy at all. I'm literally just picking random scale degrees from uh, the key and it just ends up working, of course. Most 
most progressions you can come up with that are just chosen root notes from any given key are just going to work because they're all built to the same notes. You can make them better, of course, but again, it's just pretty simple. So if this is our primary progression, and then we want to have a second progression that leads to it. The second progression, we're going to put it in E minor. So E minor is the relative minor of G. And so all we really need to do is there's so many ways to go about this. One is just to start writing a new progression in E minor and then figure out how to link them later. The second is to already start thinking about how are you going to link these things. What does it mean that a progression is in E minor or G? It just means where does home feel like? Does home feel like it's G or does home feel like it's E? That's the big difference, of course. So you need to do something to convince the ear that E minor is the new tonic, not G. So for instance, if we were here... And then say I go to, uh, and I'm going to switch progressions, I'm going to go to C, D, now E. And I'm going to hang on this. So now to me, this really feels like home now, E really feels like home. And then back to the key of G. So what I did there was write a progression that emphasizes E minor. I walk up to E minor from below it. I was going from C to D to E, and I'm holding on E, right? That's a simple idea. We're going to talk about more practicalities of like why you might choose those chords or whatever in a little bit. But the point being that one progression was centering on G, one progression was centering on E minor, but they are relative keys, so everything feels totally smooth. Right? There's no like strange key changing sensation or anything like that. It just feels completely natural because they're relative. Um, then we talk about parallel modes. Again, this is the same tonic, but different notes. So G major to G minor. That's something that happens again all the time as well. You can just have one section of your song in G major and you can have another section of your song in G minor. And most of the time, honestly, you can just brute force it. You can just switch and play. Both scales are centered on um, G, so it just works. For instance, if we we're taking the same one, one, four, sorry for the boring rhythms here, <laughs> six, two. Now, let's say we want to get to this, uh, whatever it's called, uh, G minor. I'm just going to start playing chords out of G minor. So if I'm in, I'm in my last chord of G major right now, I'm going to switch to a chord that comes out of G minor, say B flat. Then I'm going to walk my way into G minor. So I could play B flat into D into G minor. something's changed but honestly like it's kind of a cool feeling that's without even having to get too technical about it you can just straight up switch you can just switch between relative modes and you don't have to even just make a hard line and say here I'm in G major and here I'm in G minor but it can just you can pull from either one at any time and this is a, a whole technique called mixed mode technique and I've talked about it a lot on the channel before but the idea being that the chords of, say, G minor and the chords of G major are basically interchangeable. You can use them at will in any way you want, back and forth. Um, yeah, it's there's, of course, principles, more principles to it than that. But relatively speaking, to get you start experimenting, that's an easy way to think about it. Hello, Sophocles. Welcome. Reb says, nice. Love how songs from Radiohead muse and seem to switch so many keys without it seem, sounding cheesy or a fuss. Yeah, tell me about it. Key changes, we're going to talk about that too in a little bit. But anyway, let's continue on for now. Kla, welcome. Okay, so, nursery rhythms today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. 
The last thing, we're, to, we're under a category right now, right? We're talking about how to unify progressions, and we unify them by key. The first way to unify by key is by literally the same key. Everything's in G major. This progression's in G major. This progression's in G major. This, it's easy. The next is relative key. This one's in G major. This one's in E minor. Or this one's in G major. This one's in A Dorian or whatever. You can definitely do that. There's lots of techniques to go about it. I can't cover all that stuff today, but it's as a conceptual principle, you can think about relative keys like that. Parallel keys, parallel modes, that's the next. All the modes built on G. You can go from G major to G minor and back. You can do it in the same progression. You can do your verse and chorus in G major, but have your bridge in G minor. We're going to talk about some stuff like that in a bit. All sorts of possibilities with the parallel key stuff. It all works because all of those modes, all those scales are built on G, of course. So all the tones that come from them are generated by that tonic, and it all makes sense to our ear. It's kind of like an easy to understand thing. The last thing to unify by key is a key change. Now, the new key is not a relative key. It's not, I mean, it can be, but it's not a parallel key, can be. I'm talking about a totally different key now. And this can be done as well. We're going to have a couple examples too, where one section of a song, say the verse is in a certain key, and then the bridge is in another key, or the pre-chorus is in another key, or whatever you want it to be. And there's ways to do this, but in terms of unifying, again, the two keys have to be unified somehow. They can be unified um, through a pivot chord, so that one chord is common between both keys, and you can use that chord to pivot between the keys, which is extremely common for key changes. And that's the unifying principle in those two things. And when you play that chord, the composer already has switched the keys in their mind, but the listener doesn't know that yet. The listener is unaware that that chord is now some other function in a new key, and they just continue on as if it is, and then the listener catches up and understands over time. We'll look at some of that just shortly. Um, the other is, in terms of unifying in a key change, just using the same progression. Like, you know, this sort of like, I don't know, most basic kind of uh, key change that everyone is aware of and probably makes fun of. <laughs> if you're here and then you just go. Right, I just literally go up one degree and play the exact same progression. The unifying characteristic is that the progression is the same in the new key. You just brute force a new key into the listener's ear, but you play the exact same progression you just played in the new key. So they understand, ah, here's that sound again, but it's higher or lower or whatever. It's not my favorite method. It can definitely work, but you know, I'm not gonna like use it on every song, that's for sure. Shamkar says, I wonder if the changes sound good because we're used to hear it or if there's a natural law. Oh, there's a natural law, my friend, let me tell you. I don't know if we can get into that today, but don't get me started on that. <laughs> Maybe that's another stream. Yeah, the truck driver, that's right, Sophocles, the truck driver key change. Just pick it up a gear or two or three or over and over and over again. Honestly, sometimes it's totally welcome and I love that thing. But other times I think that. Anyway, so that's my little rant on unifying by key. We talked about diatonic, same key, relative keys, parallel, or key change using some other unifying characteristic. We're starting to get the idea, hopefully. Two progressions work together because they're unified by some element. One of that element can be key, but it's not just has to be in the same key. There's many ways that a key can unify two progressions. The next is, uh, in terms of how two progressions work together well, is that they lead into each other. They can lead into each other either harmonically or melodically. Probably other ways too. Rhythmically? Don't know. Not what we're talking about today though. So harmonically meaning, meaning that the last chord or chords of one progression lead you logically into the start of the next progression. Um, so, sorry, Chris is saying C, F, G, B flat, C, F. What's that progression you're, you're talking about? C, F, G, B flat, C. I see. Right, you're 
grabbing like the key change thing there going into F. Maybe, or maybe I'm misunderstanding you. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're talking about this connecting two progressions harmonically. So the last chord in a progression logically leads you into the next progression. There's so many ways to do this. The basic way is to use a cadence. A cadence is a musical resolution. So if you studied um, cadences at all, the simplest kind of cadence is a 5-1. If you're in G, that's D7 leading to G. And you can basically preempt any chord with its 5. This gets into a topic called passing chords or cadences or tonicization, lots of things you can call it. I have a whole stream about that not long ago. I did a whole stream on passing chords. So I'm just going to touch on it today because I went quite in depth there before. And that was all about how do you link one chord to another. Now we're talking about progressions, linking one progression to another. But again, the last chord of this progression and the first chord of this progression, if they don't blend smoothly already, what you can do is insert a passing chord or passing chords that links one to the other. This can even be a whole new section. Verse is here, chorus is here, and there's like two bars or four bars in the middle that is the connecting link between them. But the other way to go is that um, you have a progression looping in your verse, and on the last time through, you change the last chord or two chords to lead you into the first chord of the next progression. That's a very common move. And we can look at some examples of that. We're going to find some examples in the real music as well, but let's look at it in this uh, case too. So uh, we had this basic thing. I'm so sick of the progression already. Let's make it nicer. Whoa, that's the wrong chord. <laughs> These are the same chords I was playing before. I just put extensions on them because I need it. <laughs> need it to live. So that's our progression, G, C, E, and A. Playing back in triads again. And as it's looping, on the last time around, I'm gonna play the five chord of E. So it can either replace the A altogether, which would be coming up right here. And now I can start a new progression in E minor. key of G, I just do the same thing. On the last time around the new progression, I create a cadence, a resolution that focuses on the first chord of the new progression, the original progression. So if I'm up here on the C, I know that the five chord of um, G is D. So I can play just D7 to G is the most basic way to go. And then I'm back in my original progression. So on the end of this one, I'm sticking a B7. Now I'm in the new progression. Then on the end of this progression, I'm just going to stick a five chord of the first progression, which is D. Or I can play a different cadence. I can play a 2-5-1. Sorry. And I'm back. There's many, many cadences that you can use. It doesn't have to just be 5-1. It could be 4-5-1, could be 2-5-1, could be flat 6, flat 7-1, could be 2, flat 2-1. Two, There's so many cadences. That's a whole thing in and of itself. Um, but anyway, the point being that two progressions that aren't meshing can be meshed just by using a cadence at the end of one progression into the next one. And the way that that works is you don't use the cadence at the end of the progression every time. You, all, you play your regular progression normally every time, and then only on the last repetition do you insert the cadence at the end that is the connecting link to pull you to the next one. Same here. You loop this for a while, you insert your cadence here, and it pulls you back to the original one. That's the general idea. So this means, this is what I'm talking about when I say the progressions harmonically lead into one another. Harmonic meaning chords. 
They harmonically lead into one another. Hi, Philip. Welcome. Sorry, I didn't see you there earlier. Muskliamp. Hey, welcome. Okay, so the other way to go, we're, we're currently talking about this like leading into each other. We talked about unifying progressions through keys. Now we're talking about unifying progressions through leading into one another harmonically. So cadences, but we can use cadences in different ways, as in we can create a cadence, but not resolve it. Like in that one I just gave, I'll play a bit faster. So if we're hearing this loop. Now when I come here, I can play my B7 thing, um, or I can even play a 2-5-1 if I want a cadence. And right now our ear really wants to hear E minor, right? Because it's the resolution of that cadence. But instead, we, we push the listener's ear towards E minor, but then we delay giving E minor. So in the next progression, instead of arriving right on E minor, we go to C instead. And then maybe we go to E minor. So here it is again. Here's G. One more time. Now I'm going to play the two, uh, sorry, two, five. And we hear, oh, but we hit C. That sort of thing. So yeah, welcome, Carmela. Exactly. It's like a deceptive resolution deceptive resolution, delayed resolution, whatever it is. Eventually the listener does get the chord. You do get the chord that you're anticipating, but you might not get it right off the bat. So this is not an idea for how do you merge two progressions. This is an idea for you have a progression and how do you generate a new one? So you just create a um, cadence towards the new center that you want, could be the relative minor, could be the two chord, could be the anything. You create a cadence moving towards a chord, but you don't give the chord right away. You start on a different one, and then you determine where do you put the tonic chord? Where do you put the resolution chord? This is a huge topic about where do you put the tonic chord. Tonic chords are so powerful because they are the resolution. They are the feeling of home. They're the most powerful chord, in a sense, in the whole key center. And so where you place them in the progression has a huge effect. Happy birthday, JS Box, says Carmela. Hey, is it actually JS Box's birthday today? To the master, please. Happy birthday. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we talk about leading into progressions harmonically. We can talk about leading into progressions melodically. And that can be done in the soprano or the bass or all of the voices. Soprano meaning the highest note in your chords, bass meaning the lowest note in your chords. And so say we um, trying the same sort of thing here. If we're doing this, conquer, welcome. And what I mean by melodically leading is that the top note of the progression is going to form a kind of melody in the ear of the listener, right? That's a very simple melody right now right, all that back and forth. But what I can do is, if the next chord is not fitting super well, let's say, let's say it's a B minor. B minor, the three chord in any major key is very stark sound, especially if you haven't hit it yet, right? So if we're here on one, four, six, if I just jump straight to B minor, it works, of course, but it kind of feels like, whoa, for a second. So you can soften the whoa, through melodic leading, so that if we're on that A minor, on the last voicing or voicings of that A minor, you create a melody with the top notes, not the melody of your song, but the melody of the chords, the top notes of the chords, you create a melody that leads into the melody note of the new chord. So if you're on the A minor, you can jump up to, the, say, the G here, and then when you come to B minor, you get this. 
and somehow it smooths it. Right? As opposed to where you're just kind of pushing it at someone. When the melody is walking towards something and it feels logical, like it's going to hit something, you can get away with a lot. A lot of sounds can be generated that way, for sure. Uh, we'll look some more at that when we look at the examples as well. So that's what I mean by melodically leading into the thing uh, with the soprano line, the top line, but you can also melodically lead in with the bass, right? And that's the whole matter of inversions and creating passing chords that push you into the bass. It doesn't uh, push you into the new chord. It doesn't mean that the, the chords leading you in need to be harmonically making sense. That's better if they do. But if the bass is walking, like say you're trying to walk to, I don't know, this is a very basic example, but walking to the four chord, you know, you could be on one, going to two, then one inverted with B in the bass, and that's going to lead you into four. You can, so long as the bass has smooth motion using inversions or not, that too can smooth the transition between two progressions. Um, Belzebub, welcome. Sam, welcome. Good to have you here. Okay, so uh, just to briefly re reiterate, because we're done with this section now, I talked about um, the general topic was what makes two progressions work together. And really there's two things. One is that something must unify them, and that can be usually key, or something that is related to key. They can be in the same key, a relative key, a parallel key, a key change that uses a pivot chord or whatever. They need to somehow make sense key-wise between one another, and there's so many techniques to that. Then uh, alternative, not alternatively, additionally, it helps if they lead into each other either harmonically by playing like a kind of cadence towards the new progression, a resolution towards a new progression, or melodically by the top line of the chord progression making sense. It's walking into the first note of the new progression, or the bass is doing the same. If you can get all of that going at once, that you have a unifying aspect in terms of your key, you are harmonically walking into it and melodically walking into it, you're winning. That's just how you do it. Now you know your progressions are going to work together. You can basically get away with anything after you do that, honestly. Um, so generally speaking, that's the nuts and bolts of what makes two progressions uh, work together, is that they have to be unified and then they should lead into one another in some way. Now we're not taking any considerations right now of what the purpose of that progression is in terms of is it a verse or a chorus. This is just two progressions that are just out there and they could work or not, you know. <laughs> Uh, welcome to anybody new to the stream, by the way. If you're new, please say hello. Feel free to ask a question. I'm always happy to know who's here. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Rev. I appreciate that. Okay, so moving on to the next section. If you have a question, please let me know. Stop me at any time. So what makes progression changes interesting? Right now we've talked about what, how do they work? Like, okay, yeah, we can write two progressions that work together. That can be very basic, though. We want to make it more interesting. We want to make the, the difference in the two progressions pleasing so that they feel good when you're here, and then this one also feels good. They work together, but they also feel good individually. So, Carolyn, hey, welcome. Good to have you here. So how this works is um, contrast. That's it. The contrast can be in many forms. And the key, of course, just like with any artistic endeavor, contrast makes the thing work. It makes any artistic element, whether it's in music or anything else, have meaning through its opposite or through the lack of it or through the difference of it. If your song is whatever, all seventh chords, seventh chords lose meaning after a while and their sound is not as special. If you contrast a seventh chord with triads or with any other thing, it gains more meaning. If your song has bass playing the whole time, the bass loses meaning. If it drops out for a while and comes back, it gains meaning. So things in music gain meaning from contrast, from their opposites. So, or not even opposites, but from differences. It's a huge topic. It's something really worth exploring and allows you to think about creating songs in a way. If you want to create emphasis or strength or power or meaning of a section, you have to think about what is it that makes that section what it is and how can I contrast that, right? That's a huge thing. Is your section groovy? 
Is it syncopated? Is it have seventh chords or triads? Does it have, you know, or anything other kind of chords? Is it uh, long chords or short chords? Is it major or minor? Is it tense? Is it whatever? You can think of so many parameters for a section of a song. And then you can say, what about those parameters is most important? And how do I contrast that? Because if those are the most important parts, you want the listener to feel those parts. And in order, for the, in order for them to feel those parts, they need to not be feeling those parts right before that, right? It's just like in electronic music, right? They have like a big drop with the boom, 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 all that stuff. As the drop is going, usually they're removing bass, they're getting faster and faster, things are becoming tighter, all this sort of stuff, so that when you get to that peak of that pop, they drop everything out for a second, they put a vocal sample in or whatever, and then boom, the drop comes in. The drop has huge bass, it's slower, everything is like just massive, and it gets its meaning from the contrast of the buildup. That's a very obvious example, but it can be done in so many ways. All, all seventh diminished chords challenge. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. Wow, that'll be a challenge for sure. Cake Baby Man. <laughs> Great name. Great stuff, Max. Your depth of knowledge with all this is inspiring. Oh, that's good to know. I appreciate that. I'm glad that you like it. All right, so getting on to back to chord progressions and contrast between chord progressions. So let's th think about a couple of parameters about this. One is a diatonic chord not yet heard. Rabasotho, hello. So, um, a diatonic chord not yet heard. For instance, in the one we were just playing, we had this G, we have the one chord, the four chord, the six chord, and the two chord. So a simple thing to do is just think, which diatonic chords have I not hit yet? I haven't hit a five chord, I haven't hit a three chord. Okay, let's probably start the progression, the new progression with one of those. That will be in the same key, but will clearly delineate we are somewhere new because it's contrasting. We haven't heard it yet. It doesn't need to be the first chord. It could come at any point in the next progression, but for sake of um, obviousness, we're just gonna make it the first chord. So going to the four chord. Now I'm gonna play the three chord like before. Right, as soon as that three chord comes in, you can tell you're in a new section. I could do it with the five chord as well because we haven't heard that yet. Now here's the five chord. This is my new section now. So that's one way to contrast. You just take one of the chords from your key that you haven't heard yet and either start the progression with that or put it somewhere in there because it will on its own have a whole new emotional context, right? Um, yeah, so that's the first thing. Diatonic chord not yet heard. The next would be less or more chords. So another parameter of any chord progression is how many chords are in it. Is it a four chord progression like what I'm playing? A two chord progression, a three chord, a six chord, an eight chord? You can do all that kind of stuff, right? We could convert this progression into a three chord progression if we just go like this. the two, which means I'm doubling up on one of the chords. In this case, I'm doubling up on the one. I could double up on the four. Could double up on the six. Right? That's what I mean by a three chord progression, two chord progression, whatever. So that's one of the parameters of our progressions is how many chords are in it. So when you're gonna to try to contrast two, you might wanna have, say, your verse, if it has four chords, perhaps your pre-chorus or your chorus only has two or three or six or eight or whatever. That's one way to um, generate more contrast between progressions. Another is a new harmonic rhythm. Harmonic rhythm is how fast do the chords actually change. So for instance, in this boring example, one chord per um, bar, right? That's the harmonic rhythm, one chord per bar. And then if we want a new progression, we want to change the harmonic rhythm. Say our new harmonic rhythm goes like this. Yeah, that 
that sort of thing. Ah, Shamkra, thank you so much. Appreciate that, my friend. Thank you. Um, yes, so harmonic rhythm, the rate at which chords change can be a whole new thing. So I just, I, my new harmonic rhythm there was, and then I'm holding, right? Versus this sort of thing. So if you've been playing chords, just one chord per, per bar or one chord per two beats or whatever, switch it up for the next one. Maybe three chords quick in a row. And then hold. All right, that's one way to go. Could be the same type of thing, but maybe like doubling the speed. So instead of this, it could have been doubling the speed of the changes now. Yeah, you get the idea. So harmonic rhythm is a point of contrast. Change in density is a point of contrast. That means density is, uh, say, triads or sevenths, how many notes are in the chords. If you've been playing all triads, if you now switch to sevenths or ninths or whatever, that change in density, of course, is also going to affect the sound. Another is a non-diatonic chord. So we've been talking a lot about diatonic stuff, but a non-diatonic chord, of course, is also a point of contrast. Non-diatonic means it doesn't come from the key that you're in. It might come from a parallel key. So if you've been hearing this a lot, and we have been hearing this a lot, for better or worse, probably worse. Then when I play a non-diatonic chord here, so for instance, we could take um, this flat three. Right, that immediately, creates great contrast between the thing. I grab that chord just out of G minor. That's the easy way to think about it. So a non-diatonic chord will, will give huge contrast right away, of course, because not only is it a chord we haven't heard yet, it actually has notes inside of it that we haven't even heard yet. When we take a chord like we talked about earlier, oh, I could play the three chord. I haven't heard the three chord yet. So when I play that, yeah, of course. Uh, it has its a new flavor, but it's still using notes we've already heard in the key. But when you play um, a non-diatonic chord, you immediately have new notes that not were you've not even heard yet in the key, and of course, it's going to create great contrast. Muskleamp says, Max, I've written some songs, but I know they get repetitive and boring. Can you listen to one and critique it? I know your time is valuable. If not, no problem. Are you in the Discord, Muskleamp? By the way, if anyone is not in the Discord, please check the description. Uh, get in the Discord, post the track and feedback, ask the exact question you're looking for. Uh, I want some help with whatever. It's boring or it's repetitive. Can you let me know? I'm happy to respond. A bunch of people can respond in there too. You can get a lot of uh, great critique from people in the Discord. So definitely check that out. Um, that's like the old school church hymns, a new chord in every beat. Oh, I love that stuff. We're never going to want to use the first chord, four chords again, please. Yeah, me either. I'm done with it. We will probably get a new one here shortly. Um, all right. And then the last in my list of contrast here is a key change. Of course, a key change is going to contrast massively as well. It's a whole new key. What are you going to say? So just to recap the contrast points, a diatonic chord that hasn't been played less or more chords, four chords to two chords, whatever, a new harmonic rhythm, how fast the chords change, a change in density from triads to sevenths or vice versa or whatever, a non-diatonic chord coming in, it could be the first chord of the progression, it could be the second chord, it could be whatever, it doesn't matter, or even a key change. And we're going to look at some of that as well. And we analyze some songs in a minute. Um, yes, so new diatonic chord exactly. All right, so all of that can be done together, right? If you know these points of contrast, you can think about, okay, my current progression is G, C, E minor, A minor, and it's one chord per bar, it's all diatonic. So how about with the next one, I'm going to start with a non-diatonic chord. It's gonna be a seventh, and I'm gonna have a new harmonic rhythm, right? So that's three points of contrast already. Maybe if you do too many points of contrast at once, the progressions don't link as well anymore. That's an artistic decision and you can't really give any advice on it. You just have to try stuff and, and learn as you try, of course. But knowing these points of contrast allows you a jumping off point 
If you're stuck and you say, what can I do? How do I get my pre-chorus? How do I get my breakdown? How do I get my whatever? Start thinking about what makes the chords of your current section what they are. How do you contrast them without going into a whole new world? You know, like how can you unify, like we said earlier, and contrast at the same time? So you unify through key relationships and through leading in melodically or harmonically, and then you, then you create contrast through these elements we just talked about, basically. And that the contrast is what makes the thing interesting. You can have two progressions that are nice, and yes, they work well, but they can just be boring. They can sound kind of similar. But these points of contrast allow you to think in a way that can generate interesting sounds. And who doesn't like that, right? All right. Glad you guys are enjoying it. So um, now before we start analyzing some music here, we just have some general principles to cover, and this is gonna be real quick, and then we'll get into some actual tunes. So the first is, what is the purpose of your progression? This is a really good question to ask, especially if you're a songwriter or if you just, you know, really any kind of music you're writing. For instance, in the verse, what's the purpose of a verse? What's the purpose of a chorus? How can you design your progression to emphasize the purpose of it. Are you wanting your chorus to be bombastic and huge like a pop chorus? Are you wanting it to be subdued? Are you wanting the verse to tell a story? You know, all this sort of stuff can play into your decision making of how do you write that progression. And honestly, a lot of it has to do with where do you put the one chord? Where do you put the tonic chord? Um, that has a huge effect on the overall feeling of a progression. And you could say have the verse have the tonic chord as whatever, the third chord in the progression, and then you have some pre-chorus, and then the chorus starts on the tonic chord, which of course will give it the strongest start possible. That might not be what you want, of course, it's just one possibility. The point of what I'm saying is you can think about the purpose of your progression. So a good place to think about this, two good places, one is a pre-chorus, the section that joins your verse to your chorus, if you have one of those sections. Uh, in that scenario, we're going to look at a few of them here shortly, what is very, very common as an example, very common to leave out the tonic chord in your um, pre-chorus. The tonic appears somewhere in the verse, it appears somewhere in the chorus, but in the pre-chorus, to contrast, you don't put the tonic in. So the pre-chorus feels like it's floating or building and never resolves. The resolve only comes when you finally reach the chorus. That's a very common move. For instance, the, I'm so sick of this progression we're playing here. <laughs> Let's take a new one. Let's do it in E minor now. So I'm gonna go E minor, A minor. That's my progression, this is my verse. This is reminding me of that song. Um, ah, screw it. <laughs> anyway, E minor to A minor. And that's my verse. And my key is E minor. So then let's say my pre-chorus, I play C to D. Back and forth. No E, no G. Then in my, my chorus, I start on the E. probably is. I was actually thinking of, uh, oh my god, take me to church. Take me to church. You know, that whole thing. Uh, anyway, the point being, the, the verse has the one chord in it, the chorus has the one chord in it, but the pre-chorus doesn't. It's oscillating between two chords in this case that are not the one chord, and then right before the chorus comes, like I'm going C, I'm going D. Right before, I'm going to sneak in a five chord of the tonic, and that's going to, ooh, you know, everyone's ears perk up for a second, and then you land on the new chord, and it has greater um, impact. It has impact because we've contrasted. We've been hearing the one chord, now we haven't heard it for a while, and right before we get it again, we get a chord that pushes you into it, harmonically pushes you into it. 
right? That's a kind of a nice way to think about it. The other place where you can think about this is in a bridge. A bridge is generally uh, used to contrast other sections. If you're following a kind of rock or pop song structure of like intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, double chorus sort of thing, um, you've heard your verse, you've heard your chorus, you've heard your verse, you've heard your chorus, we're tired of it, we get it, we know, we know those sounds. The bridge is here to give some kind of respite, some kind of re um, rest from the other sounds. So that's a great place to think about a wholly new vibe that somehow makes sense with the previous vibe and all the ways we talked about contrasting before, using a new diatonic chord, changing the harmonic rhythm, all that kind of stuff, that's a great place to do it in the bridge because the listener wants it by that point, right? And you give it to them in as many ways as you can in terms of contrast, but still, of course, it has to feel like it makes sense with um, the rest of the song. And that's what this is all about, of course. All right. Then um, the point of that, all that being that your sections can have purpose, not just lyrically, but also harmonically, chord progression wise. You can think logically about how do I want to structure my chord progressions so that the purpose of that section is emphasized. And you can also think lyrically, if you're saying a certain thing at a certain time, how do you emphasize those lyrics? Not just like randomly sing over just any chord progression you come up with, but say you have a particularly important um, lyric that comes up at the crux of your song. Um, you will want to emphasize that harmonically as well as melodically, as well as rhythmically, as well as whatever. Every element plays in to the overall vibe of the thing, right? So you can design your progressions purposefully based on lyrics, based on purpose, you know, based on what you're trying to achieve rather than just saying, oh, here's a bunch of progressions in the key. Why? How come those progressions? How come you're putting the one chord there? Again, think about this or not. There's no need to think about this when you're composing, or there is. It just depends on who you are and how you like to work. Some days I think about it, some days I don't think about it. But at least to hear about it, I think is helpful. It can generate new ways of thinking. Even if you don't remember all the stuff I say today, something about it creates a new way of considering how to write progressions and how to link them. I think that's the point. All right, I want to get into looking at some of these real songs here for a little bit. Neil, welcome. Good to have you here, as always. So I've got a few. I've taken time just to map out a couple of them in Studio One, my DAW here. And then some other ones I haven't, and I'll just, I'll just play them on the keyboard. That's fine. But let's start with these ones. So the first, I'll get my face out of the way. Um, the first is, let's see if we can get this spaced somewhat nicely. I don't know if you guys can read that, hopefully. This is um, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson. Uh, so you know this like... sort of thing. Uh, it's in G, funny enough, we've been playing in G. And I picked it because the song is obviously gorgeous and has a bunch of related but different chord progressions. So we can just take a quick look at what's going on in that song based on the principles we've talked about already, and we'll start to understand some stuff about it. So if we open up this verse here, and I'll make it big up here too so you can see the chords. So here we have this progression that repeats for the verse. It's G, which is the one chord in this case, D over F sharp, which is the five chord, E minor seven, D, C major seven. So it's a descending bass line. You can see it right here. And I've kind of abbreviated the rhythm of the chords just to make them more straight, just for purposes of illustration, like this. that four chord like that. The bass is walking down the scale and the chords are being harmonized, sometimes an inversion like this, and then the rest of them are root position chords. One chord, five inverted, the six chord, it's a minor seventh, the five chord, the four chord, like that. So let's say that that's, you know, your progression or whatever. Let's we'll take that as being a given for now. That's the, the first one. And this is looping over and over in the song. Now, moving on to the pre-chorus, we get this. I want you to know. 
<laughs> Careful how much I hum. Don't want the uh, algorithms to catch me. So here is a perfect example of what we were just talking about. This is the pre-chorus. Its purpose is to build anticipation, to be a linking section between the verse and the chorus. And what is the chord progression here? The chord progression is one of the most common pre-chorus type progressions that there is. You see this everywhere, everywhere, because it's beautiful and it uh, has great purpose to it. The progression is, in this case, A minor 9-ish, meaning the chords subtly change each time it goes around. Then it's like a B, or sorry, a G, add 9 to a C major 7, and back. And then again... this D sus thing. And that's our five chord, which is going to lead us back into the chorus. The point here is that it's kind of walking back and forth along these bass notes, right? One, or sorry, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, five, using five as the last to lead us back to one. We get the tonic chord, but we don't get it in its root position. We get it in first inversion. So we have the two chord, then we have an inverted one chord, G over B. So we don't get the solidity and strength of the regular tonic. It feels kind of open and airy, right? That's the idea. The purpose of this is to be kind of open and airy for a while, moving up to the four and back down to that one chord inverted and again, so it's doing this kind of like ping pong movement back and forth. And then at the climax, we hit this suspended D chord. Maybe it, uh, maybe the suspension resolves right before. I don't know exactly. And then comes into the chorus. So it's fulfilling a purpose. They've moved away from the original um, progression to a new progression that is not giving you the tonic chord, at least not in root position, we should say. It's ending on a five chord. The whole purpose of that is to build the, ah, here comes the chorus and you know it. And coming to the chorus, you get the tonic chord as the first chord. That's the stuff in that chorus there. So this is just one, one inverted, four, five. One, one inverted, four, five. One, one dominant, pulling you to four. Two dominant, pulling you to five. Now here's a great way that they used to get contrast here on that last repetition. They changed the chords just slightly so instead of one and one inverted, you get one to one dominant. And remember, one dominant, maybe you haven't learned that before, it depends on what you've studied. One dominant is the five chord of the four chord. I realize that's a complicated sentence, but we said earlier that you can anticipate any chord with its own five chord. So since we have the one and it's leading to the four, we can put the four chords, five chord <laughs> before it which happens to be the one chord dominant. So we have this, then we have a dominant chord in first inversion, going to the one. Then we're trying to get to that D, but we insert its own five chord, which is A9, A7. And then instead of D major, we get D minor seven, basically which is a very cool sound. All of a sudden you get a new tone put in there, right? This F, surprising to hear. And then after that, it comes back into the like. That sort of thing. So th all this stuff has great purpose. It's dealt with very well. And at the end of the song, they have this sort of outro section, gorgeous outro section. And it's just one chord for the whole time. I, my memory tells me it's that comes out of one of these progressions. And then it lands on this like C major nine, C major six nine, something like that. And it just stays there 
for like two minutes. Which is an interesting technique because eventually you lose the sense that that's the four chord and it becomes your new home. You've lived there for so long. The whole outro to the song is in C, it's, they have actually do a key change, but we'll keep it in this key for now, C Lydian, because that four chord has that sharp 11th, sharp fourth degree on it, and they kind of just sit there for like minutes. And it's just a great feeling. You just sit in this new mode for the whole rest of the song. So it's a relative mode though, like we talked about earlier. It's not a whole new key. It is one of the modes of the key we were already in of G, right? It's a relative mode of G. Okay, so that's that tune. Now let's look at, this is, um, what's it called? Change the World by Eric Clapton. Um, gorgeous chords in this song. Sounds, you might know this tune. So here we have exemplified the harmonic transition between two sections. This section is clearly in C sharp minor. That's four, five, one in C sharp minor, followed by two, five, one. And again, two, five, one. This is a cadence leading us into the flat six chord, and we're a cadence back into the original key again. The original key is E, and we're just going again between uh, two relative keys. The first section is in E, basically E mixolydian. It doesn't really matter though, just call it E major. And then the second one is in C sharp minor. Those are relative keys, right? C sharp minor is the relative minor of E. So again, it's a very smooth transition because they share the same notes. They're slightly different modes in that this is uh, C sharp aeolian, C sharp minor, and this is E mixolydian roughly. Um, yeah, a little bit more to it than that, but let's say that for now. And so what happens is they have we have this transition chord, which is this G sharp seven. Now remember earlier I talked about looping a progression until the very last time, and you replace the last chord with a cadence chord. You or you put in a chord that's going to lead you into the next key or the next. Uh, part of the song. The next part of the song is in C sharp minor. The five chord of C sharp is G, G sharp, G sharp seven. So G sharp seven pulls you into C sharp minor, right? So that's the technique. Right before the change comes, boom, you put in that transitionary chord. And here we have an example of that delayed resolution, that deceptive cadence. We hear this and we think, ah, oh, okay, we're gonna get the C sharp minor, but instead we get F sharp, then G sharp again, then C sharp. So we have a delayed sort of resolution. We get built up, but then we have another cadence. We have this coming into four, five, one. And then it just loops around from there. And then they get out of this, he gets out of this, by doing this descending thing and is just literally walking the bass down from C sharp right towards E. So this is approaching the original key, the original tonic of E melodically in the bass. The bass is walking it down. Harmonically, it all makes sense as well, but the point being here that 
there's a technique being used, which is start, we're starting on the new key with the C sharp key. We want to get back to E. Literally, he walks down the whole thing, do, 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 all the way down to F sharp, and then starts, boom, the original progression on E again from the beginning. So that's all those techniques we were talking about earlier. This has got everything in it. I mean, it's contrasting chord types, there's sevenths here, I mean, all sorts of stuff happening. Um, those are the two examples I've written out, and then I had just a couple I wanted to mention that are pretty interesting, um, yeah, for some other reasons. So another one, if you guys recognize this track, see if I can remember how to play it, um, something like... to rule the world by Tears for Fears. And um, yeah, gorgeous song again, wonderful progressions. And here we have our verse progression, which is one chord-ish. It's actually like the five chord over the one, and then the four chord over the one, basically. But roughly I'm gonna call it just the one chord for now. The pre-chorus, has, I guess the chorus you could say, has this building thing, very, very similar to Michael Jackson. It's almost identical. Two, three, four, three. Then the same progression in double time. Two, three, four. Hit the five, just like Michael Jackson's song does. Five, and then you finally get back to. Next time they do it, you kind of get something like this. You're building all this stuff, come to that five chord, then it plays like a G four chord. Maybe you call this the bridge. Then back to this again. So that little bridge section is hitting the four chord first, and then the one chord. You can feel the way that that one chord, when you don't put it as the first chord, but you put it as the next, it has a different weight to it, right? Uh, the resolution comes midway through the progression, which is kind of nice. Later on in the tune, part, which is maybe the real bridge, I don't really know. It's something like this. Okay, Sophocles, good to see you. Thanks for being here. So this is the relative minor of the key we're in. This is B minor 7. See my screen, so I don't know what my little thingy is telling me. B minor seven, and then it's going to like a C Lydian chord. This chord is non-diatonic, so they're contrasting the whole rest of the tune with this we talked about, right? Putting in a non-diatonic chord to create contrast. Here we have a diatonic chord to start with, but one we haven't heard yet. This is we call called the bridge. Like I said, you start the bridge off or the whatever off, the new section off with a diatonic chord you haven't heard. We haven't heard the six chord yet, so here it is. And then it goes up to this non-diatonic flat seven chord. This is C in the key of D. C, G, A, D, F sharp. So it's calling it here G major nine, sus four over C. Totally, if I can put the three in there, D11 over C, sure. So I'm gonna call it just C Lydian chord for now. It's basically D over C. Um, and then it goes to the same thing over a G and over an A. And then it just... All that 
that sort of stuff. So all the same principles being used, creating contrast, using keys to connect, right? All sorts of stuff that we talked about uh, earlier. Then let me just grab these last couple ones here. Um, you guys probably know this tune. Let's see. Um, let me think here. basically one flat six flat seven one so I'm not going to get into all that mixed mode talk today but anyway it's a mixed mode progression uh, the point being though when it gets to the chorus or sorry the bridge uh, they do a key change for the bridge and it sounds like this so playing through this thing is we've heard basically this progression the entire time G E uh, E flat F then when it's coming right up to the bridge they do that like back and forth E flat F E flat F and this is remember I talked about earlier using a pivot chord for a key change they're now going to use the F as the new home the new tonic F is already part of the key that we're in the, the progression we've been hearing and we're hearing it in its current context as like a flat seven chord leading back to one every time right like this but then when we read the repeat now we're thinking about this chord as one and we play one five back five four on this B flat chord I'm talking about in the key of F right now that's a one five four progression in the key of F and now this B flat chord becomes a new pivot chord it's the flat three of the home key which is G G flat three is B flat and then he just pushes right back in the idea so that's a really cool example of a key change in the middle of a song that actually works using a pivot chord the key is unifying there's a whole, obviously a massive amount of contrast happening between those sections but it it works uh, one more that does this is um, heaven is a place on earth oh man what a song <laughs> So you hopefully know that track, old one, of course. But what they do is in the verse, they play. One, five, two to four, two to five. Then.
that whole pre-chorus is also a key change. We've just been hearing one, five, four, five, just the most basic progression you could possibly have. Then it hits this G chord, which is the flat three of the key. And we think we're just, I mean, I think my ears are telling me I'm just hearing a flat three right now. I've not changed keys yet, but the way the melody moves and the way the chords move, we're actually in the key of B minor, basically now. Going to F sharp minor. Then it does this run up. In the key of B minor, this looks like four, five, flat six, flat seven, and I'm expecting to hear this, like res resolve to that. Maybe because we've heard the song too many times, you're not expecting that now, but <laughs> that's what would be a normal, normal expectation in that moment, would be to hear this. But instead, we get, and you can feel, whoa, all of a sudden everything kind of like lifts again back into the thing. But it was smoothed out because of those pivot chords. The pivot chords make sense in both keys, right? So the unifying thing between that key change is that there's a pivot chord that pulls you, or pulls you, it links the two progressions. And the composer of the tune, either purposefully or not, uses that chord to make the link in the listener's mind. They've already changed keys in their mind, but the listener doesn't know yet. And as the chord progression progresses, you kind of catch up and realize you're in a new key again, and then it flips back. So a key change doesn't need to happen just in the middle of a song and the rest is, is a new key. You can just key change for a section like that. But in order to do it for a section, again, you want to use some kind of unifying method. Probably a pivot chord is the easiest way to go like that. Because you need to get back to the original key, of course, so you can have to pivot back out of it. Uh, the last one I want to talk about today, and this is probably a very weird example and un unexpected, but <laughs> it just can't last in my, my thinking about it, and so it's last on my list. Um, let's see if I can remember how to play it off the top of my head. this is so cool is that the whole first progression is all in diatonic C major, one, five, four, basic as it gets. Then the chorus, I guess, I can't really remember now which part of the song it is, starts on the five chord. That's actually pretty rare in general for progressions to start on the five chord. It's definitely probably, definitely probably the um, least common, I want to say, that I see starting on the five chord. But anyway, this one does. That next section starts on the five chord. So we're here. And then here's the five, but then it goes to the two major chord, which is non-diatonic, of course. And it has that whoa feeling like, hey, this is kind of cool now. Four chord, and then resolves. So the tonic is the last chord. Five, two, then it goes two minor. This is their link kind of back to the 
more diatonic uh, major sound. You're playing two major, dropping it to two minor, moving to F, and then you're back to the original progression again. So that one contrasts just through the one extra chord, right? We're playing that one non-diatonic chord that we've not heard before. Later, that same chord flips to its minor version. They play a major, it flips to minor, and it kind of pulls you back into the original progression again that way. That's it for the number of for the songs I wanted to go over today. If anyone has any remaining questions, please go for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to review what we talked about, and then we're going to be done for the day. It will be an hour and a half on the dot. <laughs> uh, it has a free, verb, free bird vibe, but probably just two subsequent chords. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, too. Free bird. Actually, yeah, that, could, that could have been a good progression to use. Okay, so uh, today we talked about what makes two progressions work together? Something has to unify them. Usually that's a key. It can be all from the same key. It can be from a parallel key. It can be from a relative key. It can be a key change using a pivot chord, right? Then we said to enhance that, you can lead the progressions into each other harmonically using like um, passing chords, using cadences, resolution movements that resolve to the first chord of the new progression. The old progression loops. On the last time, you put in a cadence that leads you into the new progression. You do the same thing over here, and it pulls you back. Very common. Then um, also melodic leading. So the melody notes of the progression up top make sense and pull you into uh, the new one. Same with the bass. The bass can walk up into the new one. You can use inversions to do this, all sorts of techniques to get the bass being smooth. If you can get all that in one, if you can get the harmonic motion to lead into each other, the melodic motion to lead into each other, and you're unifying through a key in one of the ways we talked about, the progressions are guaranteed to work together, basically. Um, just read a couple uh, comments here so, so I don't miss anything. Dang, I came in late. Will you post the video later? Yeah, as soon as it's done, it'll be there, Tyler. Welcome. Glad you like the videos. Uh, one thing you might ask, although simple, I wasn't immediately think of which scale has G as a flat three. Which concept can I research to get a stronger grasp of this? How do I do that? I think I just know it from experience. And it's there's a lot of... Um, I don't know if you have any of my courses, Kem, Sam. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't remember, remember how to say your name. Uh, but in there, I talk about uh, how to train intervals and how to like be able to see them quickly. Because yeah, that's something you really want to be able to do fast. To be able to, say, to see any letter name, say B, and you say B is the sixth of what? It's the five of, it's the flat three of. It just takes some practice. And if it makes a big difference, of course, if you're a keyboard player. Wow, it makes a huge difference. If you're a guitar player, it's more difficult. If you're another instrument, I don't know exactly. Um, but definitely keyboard helps a lot. And it just takes playing in keys a lot. You just play in a key for a day. You play in B for a day, then you play in A for a day, G minor for a day. Compose a song in F minor, compose a song in F sharp minor. It's just something that comes over the years, I think. But you can train it through specific exercises about like, you know, looking about a major third and saying, going around the circle of fifths and saying to yourself, what's a major third of C, of G, of D, of A, of E, and so on like that. There's many techniques. I cover some of that stuff in the courses though, in case you haven't seen them. Um, okay, just to continue on what we, uh, reviewing what we talked about, what makes chord progression changes interesting, meaning the difference between two progressions, it's contrast between them. It's a balance of contrast and similarity. The similarity comes from what makes them work together, which is the key relationship and the leading into harmonically and melodically. And then what makes them more interesting is the contrast between them. Inserting a diatonic chord you haven't heard yet, inserting less or more chords in general, having a new harmonic rhythm, like how fast the chords change, a change in density from triads to sevenths, something like that, having a non-diatonic chord put in there, and a key change. Of course, that can that's a massive contrast, but it has to be handled delicately. And we looked at a few examples there just a few minutes ago. Uh, general principles we covered were like, what is the purpose of the progression you're writing? Is it a chorus? Is it a verse? Is it a pre-chorus? Is it a bridge? Is it a drop? Is it a buildup? Is it a breakdown? Why does that section exist? How do you want it to feel? How does it relate to the other parts? How should it be structured? Where should the one chord go? Should there even be a one chord in it? What are the lyrics doing? All that kind of stuff plays into these considerations. Um, 
And then, yeah, we covered those real songs. We analyzed a few things. There's nothing else to say about that. Of course, you can watch it back if you want to check those chords out. Otherwise, that's all I was really trying to say today. Let me just read these comments here before we go. Um, do you have an opinion on using a three chord with the Ionian augmented mode with a raised five compared to the Ionian mode? So you're talking about if I'm in C. This sound. Like E augmented. It's basically like an E7 augmented sound, and it will pull you to um, uh, four, or sorry, four, pull you, pull you to six, or four, or four. The point of that thing, if I'm understanding you correct, um, so is you're just watching what happens in the C chord. There's a G note. In the E augmented, or in the E major, it doesn't actually matter, there's an, a G sharp, and then you need that uh, chromatic movement to complete. So it goes G, G sharp, A. So any chord that contains that A roughly is going to work. So you can play 1, 3 augmented F, or 4, because it has the thing in it. 3 augmented 6, it has the thing in it. Probably even do two. It has a thing in it. In any of these interesting movements, what you want to watch for is not the chord names themselves. That can be helpful too, but what's actually happening in the inner lines inside of it. Are there chromatic movements happening? Are they trying to complete themselves? If they are trying to complete in a certain direction, make sure you let them do that, and then the rest of the notes can kind of do whatever. So, yeah. Okay, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, suggestions for pop songs with great chord sequences. Rajiv, welcome. Yes, I do have a lot of those. Um, let me just list off a few right now, but in the Discord, I'll actually post. Um, yep, I'll, I'll post a I'll post a post with all these in them. But some ones that come to mind. Uh, these are like classic songs. This is not modern pop songs. This is like classic pop stuff. Some ones that are great to study would be the one I mentioned earlier, Eric Clapton, Change the World, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, um, Maybe I'm Amazed by Paul McCartney, amazing one, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Simon and Garfunkel, uh, You Got a Friend in Me, Randy Newman, oh, I love that sound. <laughs> um, Bonnie Raitt, Can't Make You Love Me, Ordinary World by Duran Duran, Brian McKnight, Back at One, Depends on the kind of genre you're looking for. All those, I mean, there's, I have way more on this list. I'm just picking out a few. Um, all of those have just wonderful chord progressions for all sorts of reasons and are highly worth studying, no doubt about it. I love to keep track of that stuff, so I gladly post it in the Discord. If anyone here is not in the Discord, please join up. It's the links in the description. You can also check out some uh, courses I have by looking in the description on music theory and a new course coming out very soon, all about this stuff, all about harmony. Uh, chord progressions and chords, very in-depth, like every chord type, sevenths, ninths, elevenths, augmented, diminished, how to use them, exercises to use them. Um, yeah, it means just like, it's it's going to fulfill all your wishes, your harmonic wishes. <laughs> Should always end on a four, Rev says. Actually, yeah, that's like half my life. End songs on the four chord instead of the one chord. Please! <laughs> or anything but the one chord. Uh, okay, guys, that's it. I'm uh, five minutes beyond an hour and a half, but hey, that's fine. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover there. So I hope that was useful for you. And yeah, you can check out some of the other videos on the channel. I got one on passing chords. Last week I did one on major seventh chords, what they are and how to use them. A whole bunch of stuff related to music production, of course. I'm streaming twice a week, uh, every week. So I'm going to be on again on Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific time doing my weekly challenge entry for the Discord challenge. And this week is going to be a blast. This week, the weekly challenge is making the worst music you can make, whatever that means to you. So I'm going to be on Sunday using all my skills and experience and whatever to make the worst music that I know how to make. <laughs> so I'm actually really excited about that. I hope to see you guys there. And we're going to be listening to other people's submissions at that time as well. And that's just going to be so much fun to hear what everyone does with that. Anyway, until next time, thanks guys for being with me. I appreciate having you here. 
And I hope you have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you for all the support. And yeah, um, any questions, anything you need, come to the Discord. Ask away and help others give your opinion and all that. Tyler, if you want to submit, um, join the Discord. It's all in there. Uh, you can go check out the challenge info channel. All the info you need to submit into the um, weekly challenge is there. Please, everybody, give it a shot. I would love to hear your submissions. Um, yeah, Hari, you're late. <laughs> Good to see you, though, as always. Okay, I'm off for now, guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate you. Talk to you soon.